Coming up in today's hand history review video, adjustments when playing out of position versus aggressive recreational players, when to pick equity over no equity when barrel bluffing, how sometimes your hand is stronger and worth money than what it might seem at first sight, and how sometimes it's better to just sit out and leave the tables as your opponents are playing on a whole nother level. Make sure to rate my hands 1 out of 10 in the comments down below. Remember to like and subscribe. Without further ado, let's get into the first hand, which we will start off with a little limpy limpy in early position with ace king. Now you might be asking yourself, wacko, why so tricky limping in with the ace king in early position? Well, that has everything to do with the players left to act behind us. As in this case, the button is a loose, aggressive, recreational player. When you're out of position versus loose, aggressive recreational players, your equity realization and fold equity preflop is significantly reduced. Now, what kind of consequences does it have to our strategy? We should be opening way tighter than the original solver range suggested, right? Because that range was assuming that the players behind us are also playing GTO and we're enjoying a certain amount of fold equity and equity realization. But because there's a recreational here, that now doesn't count. Now, the quote quote normal stand straightforward adjustment we could then be making is we can start opening way tighter and probably for a bigger sizing this is one way we can punish it or we can start limping and the reason why i like limping is a player profile like this is usually not going to stick around for all that long at the table so if we are just going to really knit it up and wait for a good hand chances are that before we finally get dealt a good hand the players especially in position will have already taken his money what limping then allows you to do is it allows you to get in there and try to stack the recreational before the other players have taken his money. Another benefit of limping is that we can significantly boost the pot preflop when we want to. So in this case, I'm going to repop it to 200. So let's say he had a hand like King Jack offsuit and I would have raised to my regular 2.2x. He would just call that and now he will have isolated me to 40 and I make it 200. Instead of playing a pot that's like six big blinds, we go to the flop with a pot being 40 big blinds. So those are like two general benefits and adjustments that I like to make when the person that's position on me is very loose and aggressive. Playing low boards out of position, this is not only a limp up, but in general, let's say you made a three bat and you're playing out of position versus recreational players. What I like to do is I like to start with doing a lot of checking. Now, this is because on average, actually on both flop and turn, when checked to recreationals are going to be overstabbing. Now, if you do decide to go for a C bet, a spot that you might find yourself in quite common is that then the recreational raises you and you're not really sure what to do. This is a note that can be prevented by simply checking and letting him step. Now, all the hands that you would initially want to see bet, you now move to the check race. Now, this actually also makes way more money because now on top of your see bet, you would also have his step. So basically, you're kind of investing in your bluff. You're letting him make a bluff so you can rebluff if you have, you know, a hand like King Jack with a spade, for example. Now, obviously, I blow, I've blown up the pot significantly, which is actually very good when we're out of position as the shorter the SPR, the lower the positional disadvantage for the out of position player. Vinan goes ahead and stab half pot, which I think he, he will do with a very wide range. I think falling is out of the question. So now we have to decide, do we want to make a call or do we maybe want to just get the money in? I decided to go for the latter. I threw my money in and there's a couple of reasons why I really like this play. First of all, it reduces his positional advantage and it removes all his playability because we are simply all in so he can no longer bluff us off so let's say for example we would check call and turn is the nine of space and he jams what do we do do we call do we fold probably we have to fold but we're not really sure where we're at at the hand unless we have a very good read on our opponent if we really think he's that 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 insane that we can just literally close our eyes we call twice it's fine another advantage is when we jam is we always get to realize our equity the third advantage when we jam is that we sometimes get called by worse. So let's say he has like an ace five, five, six, a flush draw. Um, he's very likely going to call us. He might sometimes fold better, but the SPR is a little bit too shallow. I don't think he's ever folding a pair, to be honest. Uh, and he's going to fold out some hands that are pretty live. Let's say he has a hand like 10 jack of clubs or just in general, a hand like 10 jack, uh, two life cards and back to straight draw. And especially if we call that hands has a lot of playability advantage for his R hand. 
So these are, for all these reasons, I like to jam it in. Now, these type of plays are actually solver proof, but usually you want to have the king of spades simply to have more equity when he does have a pair in solver land. Obviously, everything is close, so you need that extra equity where here I don't think it's close and I want just want to be ripping in most of my ace-kings, ace-queens, ace-jacks, etc. Now, obviously, the lower we go, you know, let's say we do have ace-10 offsuit, probably I want to have a spade with it because, you know, the we will now sometimes get called by hand like ace-jack of spades or, you know, you will sometimes call you with ace-queen or ace-king offsuit and that's not obviously not very good for a hand like ace-10. Let me know. Rate this hand. Roast this hand. Do whatever you want. Comments down below. One out of ten. He does go ahead and make the call, which, you know, it's going to happen a decent amount of the time. And it's perfectly fine. Obviously, we prefer a fold and take it home straight away. And in this case, he unfortunately had a seven. Now, obviously, we still have some equity versus a seven. That's also what I like about his hand. We're very rarely dead. Deuces, four, sevens is only a very small part of Fiddin's range. We're being dealt queen 10 suited in early position phase, a raise from the regular under the gun, and we decide to go for a little flat call. Now, why do we do that? That's because the big blind is a recreational player. When the big blind is a recreational player, usually the EVs of your hands will change. If we look at a solver, we see that, for example, a hand like this, in theory, with everyone playing GTO, is probably a fold or maybe has some EV in 3-betting in these formations, but it's going to be very low in EV. What now happens is that the hands that were close in terms of folding and calling, they now become calls simply because this guy is going to get in the pot and he's going to make a lot of mistakes. The recreational indeed comes along kind of what we expected. And we see a flop of 8-7-5. That's uh, not a great flop. The recreational leads out for one big blind and the regular gets out of the way. Now we have two options here. I think we can either call or raise. Folding I think is out of the question. We only have to win the pot 11% of the time. I decided to go for a race. I think in general, this bet seems to be on the weaker side on average. And I think just raising will already generate a decent amount of fold equity. What I like about queen 10 of clubs here, if he does come over the top, we have a very easy fold. Let's say I had like queen 10 of diamonds. I would have preferred way more to see myself call. Or let's say you have a hand like 10 jack of clubs. I think this is something that players often get backwards. If you have a hand like 10 jack of clubs here, you might be more inclined to raise because you think you have equity. However, we have to take into consideration that this guy can come over the top a decent amount of the time. And then you don't want to be raising a hand that has like okay equity and raise you off. In this case, a gotcha to the nuts. He can have a lot of 6x. And then if we hit a 9, if we have 10 jack, that's obviously a situation that we would like to guarantee ourselves to be in. So if I had like a 10 jack of clubs here, I think we should always call. I decided to raise with the queen 10, just applying a lot of pressure straight away on like one pair of hands. Uh, yeah, kind of seeing what develops. Turn now is the eight of diamonds. He checks and I think most players now here would probably be done with the hand. I will talk here again about the same concept. If you have a draw here, let's say you had nine, 10, okay? I think betting here is quite a big punt. I think when the SPR gets small, and again, we have to take into consideration that this guy can now definitely just check rip it in with a five sometimes or a seven or of course an eight or a draw. I think his check raise percentage is going to be quite high here, especially on a double flush draw board. This is a general trend that you'll be seeing. Now, when that happens, when you have a low SPR or a double flush draw board like this, we really want to be careful with bet folding equity. So... If I had a draw here, let's say a king, jack of hearts, I would always be checking. And my betting range would become very polarized between either just air or something that can always bet call off. Let's say you do have 9, 10 of hearts or 9, 10 of diamonds. I think that's at some point, there's a cutoff point where you no longer have to bet fold and you can just bet call your hand. That's when you should be betting your equity draws. So I decided to barrel here with queen 10, simply thinking that if he now comes over the top, it's perfectly fine. I think he's going to do that quite often, actually, when he has an 8, simply because there's two flushers on the board. People fast play a little bit more. I will actually be good some of the time. This is actually something you have to always take in consideration when playing versus recreational players. Let's say he has a hand like 9-10 here or queen-6. He's very likely to call. So he could now, for example, fold a hand like pocket deuces, and he can call us with 9-10 or queen-6. So... In general, having high cards, I usually like ace highs, for example. Let's say I have a hand like ace four here, ace four of clubs. Perfect hand to, to just barrel and often check back river and win. Filling calls. 
And now the river is the ace of diamonds and he decides to check. Now, checking is not standard for recreational players. They do have the tendency to dunk out quite a lot on all streets, which he hasn't done so far. So I'm kind of leaning towards thinking that he's either going to have a five or a seven. I think that's going to be the biggest part of his range. Obviously, he could still have hand like 9, 10 or queen 6, which we're beating. But I do think he will also sometimes lead that out as a bluff. So I decided now to put max pressure on a 5 and a 7. Like I said, I think an 8 is very much reduced the way he played his hand. I think a hand like 6, 9 or 4, 6 is definitely reduced. He could have gotten that in on the flop, could have gotten that in on the turn. If he did make a flush, he could sometimes dunk the river. Obviously, not always. I think the only question here is your sizing. If you're just trying to bluff him off a hand like... King 10 of hearts, King Jack of hearts, you know, hands that beat you or five or seven. Maybe we could also just bet smaller. I decided to not risk it and just jam my stack in. Before we see the showdown, let me know uh, in the comments down below. One out of 10, do you think uh, this hand was well played or do you think this is just a complete punt? Finn did decide to call and he got there. We were just investing in this pot, value raising flop, value betting turn. He unfortunately did get there on the river. But for example, if he has three six of diamonds, he will maybe also have three six of hearts. So obviously we have the beat also when we check, but I do think uh, betting is just definitely better. He wins the pot then, uh, well, we might stack him later on in the session. Next hand, we're going to be defending the big blind with pocket sixes. We flop a set. Now we could consider dunking. I wouldn't hate it. From a theory perspective, this is probably not a board that we want to be dunking on. It's a bit too high. So that means that he will now also connect and that significantly reduces our advantage. Let's say it's four, six, seven. Definitely in for dunking, but now we start with a check. Finna checks behind and the turn is a nine of clubs. Now, obviously this is not the greatest card. We would have preferred to see a king of hearts, but hey, you got to play the cards that you're dealt and we have to now come up with a strategy. I think we want to keep our bet frequency on the higher side and therefore have a small sizing. So that's what I decide to do. And now villain raises. And this is where it becomes very, very interesting if we think about his raising range. Now, he could definitely obviously be raising an 8, even though you probably have to be a little bit careful with raising an 8 simply because... An eight now, yes, is still good, but we have more than 1K behind and there's still rivers to play that can significantly change the board. So raising too much eight hacks here, I think will be a problem. Other more obvious raises that people will find here will be hands with equity, which I think is mainly gonna be done more in practice than in theory for reasons that I actually explained in the queen 10 of clubs hand. I actually decided to go over the top and let's say you're now sitting here with a hand like ace five with a five of clubs or king queen with a club. You know, it's it's not great. So I think in theory, the race should be a little bit more polarized and I think in practice it's a bit more merged, so a bit more linear. So meaning that he has more hands with equity, he probably has more eight x And I think what this does is it puts quite a lot of pressure straight away on a hand like king eight, right? Because king eight, if we think about it, what I'm saying is I'm saying I have a flush. King eight is dead against the flush, right? And from his perceived situation, my bluffs would probably be something like king jack with a club. So if he thinks about my range, it's like, well, I'm either dead when he, when he has king eight because, you know, Weko either has a flush or he probably has a lot of equity. He has like king jack with a club. So I think there's a very big chance an eight now folds straight away. And let's say he has a hand like two pair, like nine, 10, seven, nine, or like a king jack with a club or king queen with a club, he's likely going to call. So this is what I meant with on first, on first glance, my hand might actually not look that great. But if we think about it, it's actually a very good hand. So I decided to come over the top, fill in calls, which I do expect to happen some of the time, of course. And river now is a five. What is the highest if he play? Well, if we thought about it, that he could have a hand like 10-9 or 7-9 or a missed flush draw, I would say it's probably block. I think block is a perfectly fine play here. But I in-game decided to go for the check as I was more focused on the fact that I think on the turn he has a lot of king jacks, king queens, ace jacks, ace fives type of holdings with a club than that he has necessarily hands that I now lose value from. So I check. Finn throws out a big bet. Going for pot. 
And I decided to make the call. This was kind of the plan that we had right on the turn. Make him fold an eight. Make him call with a flush draw. When the flush draw miss, we decide to hero call. Let me know. Comments down below. One out of ten. Do you think this is a great, great, great played hand? Or do you think this is simply a punt? Let me know. He decided to show up with the king jack with the king of clubs. So our plan worked out perfectly. And we scooped in a nice little 1.2k pot. And for the last hand, we get dealt pocket force. Open it up. Get flatted on the button. And on the big blind, and we see a flop of ace, king, four. It gets checked to us, and we have to think about strategy here. Now, I do think we have some advantages, and I don't think range checking here is a great strategy. So I decided that I would have a betting range, but it's not going to be a linear betting range. So I'm going to construct a more polarized betting range. So I decided to go for a two-thirds pot i think somewhere between half and two-thirds it's probably fine and basically what i'm saying is that i have a hand like ace queen ace king pocket force and bluffs with probably some queen 10 some 10 jack some queen jack suited with back doors a four let's say at four or five suited and probably a hand like pocket fives would probably be a good bluff here as well so that's a low betting frequency with a range that i now kind of explained filling calls and big blind folds. Now, when villain calls, I think he's very, very ace x heavy. I think what the sizing also does. Let's let's say he has a hand like ten jack of hearts. I expect him to just fold straight away, or maybe even a hand like ten jack with a backdoor flush draw. So, I think his range is dominantly going to be ace high. So when the turn now is a queen, like I said, I think most ten jack suited are just going to fold the flop. So, I think we have. The best hand basically always. So this is basically still the nuts. And I decide to use that advantage and go for an over bet. Now, I think the bet here is maybe a bit too big. I think somewhere around pot would have been slightly better because obviously we do have to take into consideration that River can come a diamond. He can definitely have ace of diamonds or maybe king jack of diamonds, a 10 and a jack, which would also really kill us because I think if he calls again, his range is really much weighted towards ace jack suited, ace 10 suited, ace queen suited or a race queen in general, like I said, king x, king x of diamonds, ace x of diamonds. So in general, you don't really want to be investing too much money when the river can really shift the equities in the other person's favor. So I think this bet is a bit too big. Filling calls. Now the river is the worst card possible. Ace x of diamonds got there, king x of diamonds got there. Ace 10 suited got there. These are all hands that I think can definitely be in his range. We could maybe find a bet sizing for which we could value better hands, probably around 10%, try to get a call from Ace Jack or Ace Queen. But I decided to uh, to check and kind of give up. And when Villain jams, I didn't really thought much about it and just snap folded. And to my surprise, Villain showed up with turning Ace Queen into a bluff. Now, this guy we've actually had on our podcast, it's Mr. Prodigy. Shout out to Mr. Prodigy for owning. And this is kind of what I meant with sometimes, guys, you know, you just have to accept that some of these guys are on a whole other level. And we should just sit out, leave the table, and probably find different players to play against. Because this guy is at a whole other level. Shout out to Mr. Prodigy. If you haven't seen the podcast, go definitely check it out. It's a very smart guy, very good talk. Let me know what you thought about this hand, how I played it. I think the main decision-making point that we could talk about is maybe the turn sizing. And I guess the river strategy, obviously, if he always bluffs, always ace-queens and ace-jacks, he's probably going to be significantly over-bluffing, right? So you could make an argument, well, if you really think your opponent's at that level, then he's over-bluffing. But the majority of players are going to be massively under-bluffing here. They're just going to check behind a screen and not really think about it. And this shows, I think, uh, what makes him such a strong player that he considers turning a head like Ace Queen into a bluff here. Really shows you that he's thinking about the game. Hope you liked this video. If you did, leave a like. If you liked this video, chances are you will like this video here as well. So go check that out. And I'll see you guys in the next one.